These words of Jesus are like real treasures that will take you to an eternity with him if you put these words into practice. And if you don't, it's like shifting sand under your feet. And life has a way of bringing difficulties to our lives that show us what we're standing on. And I try So uh, welcome everybody. My name is Keith Thomas of GroupBibleStudy.com and we are in, uh, we're teaching a series about the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 7 tonight. So uh, we're going to look through chapter 7 of the book of Matthew verses 1 through to 29 and I've entitled our study tonight, Walking Out True Faith in God. So when when Jesus was there on that hillside, it says a mountain, but but if you go to that area, is what most of us would call a hillside. I've been there several times, walked down the hillside, sat on the rock that many people think that he taught from and threw his voice down below to thousands of people that were there at the time. And he spoke these beatitudes, or what we like to call those be beautiful attitudes. And the people were just so hungry because they knew that in Christ they had met someone different completely. He taught as no one ever spoke before. And he showed them clearly the ways of the kingdom and he gave an open invitation for all men and women and children to enter into his kingdom and experience it. Now, as we think back to that day when he shared this message, uh, often, likely, we've said, oh, if only I'd have been there. How wonderful it would have been to lay out a tablecloth and gather my kids around and we'd just sit on the, we'd eat our pita bread and fish and whatever have you and just listen to the Lord Jesus teach. Wouldn't that be awesome? Brothers and sisters, one day we will stand or sit before the Lord Jesus and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. And how wonderful it would have been to see him actually perform miracles in front of your very eyes, like that, like that man with the withered hand and uh, he, just, he just had him to stand out in front of all of them in the synagogue that day. And as he stuck out his hand, his hand was healed in, the, in front of their very eyes. And I'm sure there were gasps of appreciation. They saw that this was nothing magical done by him. This was the power of God resting on that poor man with the withered hand and totally healing him or others that were completely lame or blind or whatever. He, he healed in front of people's eyes and, and staggered their imagination that this is the work of God that is in front of us. So if you've ever had thoughts like this, I, I encourage you to lay up these words of the Sermon of the Mount, these beautiful words, and write them on the tables of your heart and let them be solid in your will and in your appreciation and in your values. Sometimes the things of God are not valued by some and I, I believe that all God's people should value his words highly. He wants us to behold him as we see his character and live with him in worship and prayer. The Christian pastor and author A.W. Tozer, I love that writer, if you've ever read any of his books, he's, he's full of content. And he once said, we can have as much of God as we want. What? I, I really do believe that's true. We can have as much of God as we want. If we will pursue him, to that degree, God, out of his love for us, will give us more of himself. Because 
it is not in God's character to withhold anything good from us. And the most precious thing that we could ever ask him is for more of his life, more of his character to be in us, showing forth to this evil world what the Lord Jesus is like. What stops us from knowing the presence of God in our lives? Well, we could talk about unforgiveness, bitterness, and anger with our fellow man. These are the things that stops one from being intimately acquainted with the Lord. And there are some things that Jesus has already addressed as he gets to the heart of the matter, which really is the heart of this sermon, is getting his laws and his thoughts and his character embedded into our hearts and minds. So Jesus continues to address our heart issues in this next chapter, chapter 7, verses 1 to 29. You know, as I thought about this next passage, I, uh, I thought about self-criticism. One of the most damaging things to us is not only to criticize ourselves, but for others to critique us. Have you ever been on the end of harsh judgmentalism? Criticism can crush a person's spirit. As I thought about this and judging, because Jesus starts out, do not judge. What's he meaning there? And I thought of this one instance where I was judged. I was a young Christian and I had a passion right from the start of wanting to serve the Lord and be effective as much as I possibly could to win as many people as I could, to build up the body of Christ as much as I could, to do as much damage to Satan's kingdom as I possibly can with my life. He'd messed up my life so much <laughs> that I thought, I've got to get revenge on him. <laughs> so I am going to be involved in his God's kingdom as much as I possibly can and do as much damage to the enemy's kingdom as I possibly can. But... When I, I started to learn how to preach, and I'm talking about in my 20s, I had this very influential person that heard me preach a couple of times, and he came up to me later, and, and he said, no, he, he advised me to give up preaching because I was no good at it. <laughs> and I, and I've, that crushed me. And that kind of thing, if you kind of set your heart on something, you feel like God has called you to do something, and yet you hear that kind of judgmentalism and criticism, it kind of gets to the root of your inner being. And words are damaging, so we have to be careful with words. Uh, a, p a person who experiences that kind of judgmentalism can do one of two things. They can either say, well, if I'm no good at it, what's the point in carrying on? And stop and figure out, well, I've got to do something else. Or they can set their heart on working hard at it. And that was how I responded to that criticism. I said, if I'm no good at this, then I'd better get good. <laughs> so I devoted myself to uh, the Word of God and to... Uh, live it out. First of all, it has to be in me before I can help others. So I, I really decided, I've been a worker all my life as a commercial fisherman. I knew how to work. I worked from 2.30 in the morning to 5 and 6 o'clock at night, six days a week. So I knew how to work. So I was, I was willing for God's kingdom to work at it. And uh, the enemy can sow damaging words in our spirit like that. I've forgiven that person. <laughs> I've never confronted that person with it. Uh, and as, to me, as dead and buried. But it did, it did something to me. It, it made me better at what I felt like I'd ca been called to do. So there's things that you learn along the way, and I decided I'm going to learn the lessons to be someone that's good at what I'm called to do. And in his words in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had words to say 
about being careful in our judging of others. So, chapter 7, verse 1. Judging others. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or the beam <laughs> in your own eye? I'm sure there were chuckles in the crowd as he said that. He has a way of putting pictures into your minds. Can you imagine a big beam coming out of a person's head and they're trying to stagger around, trying to look at the speck in someone else's eye? No, it's ridiculous. And there's a great image to help us remember and recall such things. How can you say to your brother, verse 4, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye you hypocrite, you stage actor on the stage of life. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So let's have a question, just to get you thinking. What are some of the thoughts about judgment that you can take from this text? I'll give you just a few minutes. The word judge in verse 7 is from the Greek word krino from which we get the word critic. The root meaning of this word is to separate, but it can also mean to judge in a courtroom or to discern truth from error. Discerning truth from falsehood is something we are meant to do. We, we are meant to judge what's true from what's false. So it's not saying that. Jesus is not saying we are never to make any judgments because he goes on to say in verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. What's he talking about? Dogs was another word for unbelieving Gentiles. So he's, he's talking about those people that have no interest at all in that and try and shut you down when you bring the word of God to them uh, don't give those people what to you are sacred. Just like, like a pig, he goes on to talk about a pig. You, you don't bring pearls and put a, a, a ring of pearls around a pig's snout because the pig will not recognize that which is sacred, that which is precious. Uh, and are these truths that we've been going over for years now... <laughs> Uh, we are learning the treasures of the kingdom. We are learning to understand truth from error. And someone that, that's from a beastly world view and has no interest in the kingdom of God, we, we should not cast our pearls to them, our pearls of wisdom to them. But we are not expected to turn a blind eye to error. We are to look and evaluate truth from error when we hear it. Paul taught, Paul the Apostle taught his protege, Timothy, not to lay hands on someone quickly. 1 Timothy 5 verse 22. What was he saying? Not to lay hands. He's not talking about healing. He was talking about giving leadership to people in your church. He was writing to Timothy, who was head of a church that he had planted, and or the pastor. Nowadays, we would call him the pastor of a church. And he, he was saying, when you, when you give leadership authority away, just don't give it to anyone. Check out their character first, which obviously means that you have to evaluate and judge a person before you give them 
leadership roles. A leader has to be a man of character and integrity. So there are stages in a person's life and we should be careful not to squash uh, a person's growth. For instance, there are th the growth of a, a person's life in Christ is likened to a plant that goes through four stages from germination to growth to fruiting and then to seeding. So these are likened to our stages throughout our lives as Christians. Well, when a person has just become germinated, so to speak, we are not to crush them with a critical spirit and say, well, you're just no good at that. Don't do that. It's like <laughs> I'm using myself in a negative word here. But that crushed me, and but for the grace of God, I don't know where I would have been if I'd really listened to that person. And I'd probably gone back to fishing for a living. <laughs> uh, but, but we can critique people and shut down their spirit when we evaluate them. But, but instead, we are to let them grow in grace. I don't know about you, but in my younger days, the Spirit of God didn't throw everything on me. He, I was learning the Word of God quite fast because I was just so hungry for reality and for truth. But I found that the Holy Spirit targeted certain areas of my character first. And I've told you before, the first thing he put his thing on was my tongue because being amongst a number of other commercial fishermen and being away from families and children, the worst things comes out of a man's mouth. So after my conversion, the spirit started dealing with, with my tongue. But then he moved on to other areas of my character. Now, if, he, if he'd have unloaded on me, I'd have just probably fallen away. That is not the spirit's goal. He he. he shows us areas. Now, I liken it to the taking of the land by Joshua. Are you with me? When Joshua came into the land, and the land is a, is a type of overcoming this land. Are you with me? So when Joshua came in, his first target was Jericho. And God gave him a miracle with Jericho. But then there was Ai, and they failed miserably at Ai. Then it was Bethel, and then it was another city, and then it was five cities to the south, etc., etc. And the battle went on. So I, I liken the, the building up or the possessing, there's a good word, possessing the territory that God has given you. So we are to possess this territory. We are to possess our souls and to let the Holy Spirit shape our character through one battle after another. Not, don't try and work on everything. Let, let the Holy Spirit point out a certain area of your life that you need to overcome. Then think of strategies to overcome that particular area of your life. So be careful to listen to the correction of the Holy Spirit as he the enemy is the one that will always come along and point the finger and condemn and say, ah, you're no good because you do that. But the Holy Spirit has not targeted that area in your life yet. So be, just be aware of what the Holy Spirit is convicting you of and don't be so concerned with trying to do win the whole land all at once. Are you with me? So we should work on our own character, first of all, before we think that we are going to be used in another person's life. Here's how Jesus went on to say, Ask, seek, knock. Verse 7. And I didn't, take, I didn't mention that. He, he said, take the beam out of your own eye. We talked a little bit of it. What is he talking about? You've got to work on your own character. Get, that, get areas of your own life under control 
of the Holy Spirit before you can help others. So ask, seek, and knock, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone, everyone? Everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So let's think about that. The Lord now turns his attention to giving input and encouragement to prevailing prayer. The verbs he uses are in ascending degrees. You notice that. Going from asking, first of all, asking the Father to going a step further by adding action to our asking. Seeking. Seeking out the answer to our asking. Too many people passively wait for God to just give him the answer. They Sometimes they hope that it'll just drop out of the sky or maybe it'll come in the mailbox depending on whatever you're, you're praying for. Um, but sometimes we need to go out and seek. Seek and you will find. And um, sometimes it means seeking a better job. <laughs> and, uh, but the third level of intensity is to accompany our seeking by knocking. The thought is one of pounding on the door, <laughs> adding passion to our prayers. So in the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, which is translated into English for us, uh, the asking, seeking, and knocking are all in the present imperative. Oh, I didn't do that well at English. I, I liked English, but well, what does that mean? It means that we are to keep on asking. We are to keep on seeking, and we are to keep on knocking. It's just continuing to knock. Don't just knock once and give up. So Jesus presumes that all those on the hillside that day, that they are good fathers. And he appeals to their desire to give good gifts to their children and saying that it is foolishness to think that the Heavenly Father would do less than ourselves. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those of his own that love him? We are to expect God to answer prayer and to seek and knock if it doesn't come to us right away. The Gospel writer Luke goes a little bit further in a parallel passage of teaching here. He adds a mini parable to give us an example of what the Lord is talking about. So let's look at the parable of the friend at midnight. So what he's talking about is adding passion, desire, and persistence to whatever you're asking for. This will obtain results in prayer. The whole idea of faithful persistence is so important to the Lord that he gives us this story. So imagine you're sitting on the hillside there and, and you're given this picture. So let's read the parable of the friend at midnight. Verse 5 of Luke 11. I've got it in your notes. Luke 11 verses 5 to 8. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend. And he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. 
because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I kind of think he had a bit of an attitude in being woken up at midnight for some bread. I can't get up and give you anything. Then Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, isn't that interesting? I've got that underlined in your notes. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So let's evaluate this. Well, what's going on here? What's he talking about? We have a story of a traveler who's, and, and often people traveled uh, at night because of the heat in the Middle East. It gets pretty hot. We're, we're talking 90 degrees up to 100, depending on the, the terrain and the area in, in Israel. So during the summer months, they would travel at night time because it was a lot cooler. So this traveler was on a journey and he decided to stay the, re the rest of the night with a friend as he passed through a particular town where he knew his friend was. He didn't have an email. He didn't have a cell phone. So he could, hey, hey, I'm going to stop by your house. Do you mind if you stay up a little bit tonight? Because I should be getting there about midnight. No, that's not the way. He just surprised his friend. And it was a sacred obligation to give hospitality and provide any traveler with uh, food and a place to sleep. So what should the house owner do when his friend comes to him? Uh, it's a shame not to give him some food, first of all, and then let him sleep on the floor, or if he has a spare room, give him a bed. So no bread to put before his friend was a considerable embarrassment to him. But he did have a friend that he thought might get up and give him some bread. So off he went to wake up his friend and get some bread. So it was common in the Middle East at that time for whole families to sleep in the same room. Even today in some countries in Asia, this is not uncommon, and I experienced this firsthand. In 1976, I traveled with a friend across, across Europe, and then through Turkey, through, uh, through the Middle East, into India, all the way over land, quite a trip. Lots of stories. I'll, I'll spare you the stories tonight. But one particular city or town that we came in, uh, it was already kind of late and we were hungry, so we were told about this certain hotel that we could stay the night after we got something to eat. So uh, we went and, and just in, introduced ourselves to the guy at the door and he told us how much it would be and we thought, wow, that's pretty cheap. And things at that time were really cheap. I meant to say we'd stay for three nights in India for less than an English pound, about a dollar and a half for three nights wasn't the best of places to go to, but, <laughs> but I didn't care. I was that kind of person. I was young, and who cares? <laughs> so anyway, we went off and got our food and came back to this place we were going to stay, and we were let into the room. And guess what? We're talking about 24 other people laying on the floor. <laughs> and all, there was no furniture in the room. It was a big room, about the same size as this room, actually, and, uh, and there was just a heater right in the middle of the room and all it was all carpeted. Well, you couldn't, couldn't really call it carpeted. It was like um, soft pillow kind of uh, floor. So everybody was already asleep. There was about 24 other people in there already asleep. And we were like, this is amazing. But that's how it is in, in, in the Middle East. It was a communal sleeping place. And to Westerners, it seems odd that people would all sleep in the same room. But this was not abnormal at this time. And Jesus describes a man who awakened after midnight and had a similar situation where his family all slept together in the same room. 
This situation would mean that he had to get up and be careful not, not to step on his kids as he could hear his uh, friend outside knocking on his door. And he oh, who's that in the middle of the night? So he got to be careful and he had no lights on, so he's trying to see his kids and stand, not stand on them. And, and then he, when he gets to the window, his friend, hey, I need some bread. Can you come down and give me some bread? And just go to go home. I'm not getting up. You wake up my kids, and I'm 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 not going to get up. What does the guy do? He rams on the door even more. He will not let his friend go back to bed, and he's thumping on the door. Come, give me some bread. Give me some bread. Bread. And he says in verse seven, "My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything." hoping that that would put him off. But it doesn't put him off. <laughs> and finally, in the end, he gets up and he goes downstairs and he gets him the bread that he needs. William Barclay, in his commentary, writes this, I quote, In the East, no one would knock on a shut door unless the need was imperative. In the morning, the door was opened and remained open all day, for there was little privacy. But if the door was shut, that was a definite sign that the friend did not wish to be disturbed. But the seeking house owner was not deterred. Instead, he kept knocking. So, I'll give you a question. In telling this parable, why do you think Jesus chose to include a man who was reluctant to get up and help his friend? What do you think Jesus was trying to illustrate by this character's actions and the way he responded to his friend? I'll give you a few minutes. What's the point of the parable we're asking? So, Andrew Murray wrote an excellent book that I really recommend, With Christ in the School of Prayer. Excellent book. I've read it at least two times. It's one that I like to go back to every now and again and just remind myself of some good teaching. And he writes this, What a deep heavenly mystery persevering prayer is. The God who has promised and who longs to give the blessings, holds it back. It is a matter of such deep importance to him that his friends on earth should know and fully trust their rich friend in heaven. Because of this, he trains them in the school of delayed answers. I like that. To find out how their perseverance really does prevail. They can wield mighty power in heaven if they simply set themselves to it. The emphasis is on the word boldness in Luke 18 verse 8 in the New International Version. Or in the King James Version, the word importunity is used. It's not a word that we're very familiar. It's not an everyday word anymore, importunity. The Greek word anodeia is translated into our English word boldness in the NIV. This Greek word literally means to be without shame. The key word study Bible that I like to use uh, says about this word that it means shamelessness, unabashedness, audacity. The word describes the brazen persistence displayed in the pursuit of something, an insistence characterized by rudeness and a lack of compunction. Wow. The King James Version translates anadia using the word, the English word, importunate. Webster's New World Dictionary says that the word importunate means urgent or persistent in asking or demanding, refusing to be denied, 
annoyingly urgent or persistent, troublesome. So another question, last question. I'll give you a chance to think on that word. Why would Jesus use this word? What does he want us to understand about prayer by approaching God with shamelessness or audacity? I'll give you just a few minutes. So, brothers and sisters, I don't believe that I've attained this myself yet, but it's not something that I have to attain before I can teach it. But I really believe that there is a faith and persistence that will not let God go until one gets what they need, a little bit like Jacob, that would not let the angel go until uh, he had wrestled with him during the night and obtained the blessing. This describes a faith that pleases God. And indeed, the point of the parable is that the man went from asking to seeking to knocking urgently on the door. And and he would not let his friend fall back asleep until he gave him the bread that he needed. What Jesus is saying in this passage is that if a grouchy friend can be persuaded to get up and give his friend some bread due to some shameless, brazen persistence, how much more will God, who longs to feed and clothe his people when they ask him, this story is given to us to encourage us to prevail in prayer and not give up. If importunity and shameless audacity can be used to bring one's need before a man who was angry at being inconvenienced, how much more will God do for us? God is infinitely kind, willing and ready to do good for us, but he longs to see our faith stretched with some persistence and some passion uh, and learning how to overcome by persisting in prayer. So let's move on. Jesus carries on from talking about persistence and faith in prayer by talking about the golden rule that should govern the behavior of every believer. Verse 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, this kind of teaching had never been heard up to that point. Uh, this saying of Jesus has been called the capstone of the whole discourse, being a new way of looking at life completely. And before this time, the saying was always in the negative. Rabbi Hillel, for instance, that lived before Jesus, said these words, What is hateful to yourself, do not to another. That is the whole law, and the rest is commentary, he said. There, according to Rabbi Hillel, was the golden rule in the negative. But Jesus put a new slant on this by doing there is the golden rule in its negative form, but Jesus is teaching a whole new slant on the behavior of the believer in Christ. Before the Sermon of the Mount, the prevailing teacher was teaching was not to do certain things that we wouldn't want others to do to us. But Jesus put it in a positive form. Do to others what you would have them do for you, to you. A man by doing nothing could believe that he was pleasing God, but Jesus is saying for us to take steps of action to do things that will change society by positive action. Let's talk about the narrow and wide gates. Verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate, 
and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You know, people make decisions many times every day, but deciding to live by our flesh and what we want to do and how we want to live our lives is seen by Jesus as a broad gate, a broad gate and a road that many walk along. Jesus gives us a picture of a man entering this huge gate into a major city and as he gets through the great through the gate there's this huge avenue very wide in front of him uh, this way is so wide that it'll accommodate any ideas any god you want to bring on it any thought that you think uh, is so wide it'll accommodate everything but it's the way to destruction you can carry anything on your shoulders. You don't have to get it off to enter through that gate. Uh, that way takes no effort on your part and no change of heart is required to enter through that wide gate. All are accepted through that way. Unfortunately, it is the way to destruction and many are going that way. I don't know about you, but at times I've reflected on my life when we have gone through that gate and uh, and many of us have gone through that gate and walked that road and thought that this is great it's pandering to our fleshly wants and desires but there's no peace and there's no inner comfort and that way has taken a toll on our character but Jesus also talks about narrow gate, a way that's not easy to find. And it takes effort and the throwing off, the casting off of lethargy and a passive spirit to seek and find God with all of our hearts. There are only a few who find and walk the narrow road. The author Alexander McLaren liken the first two beatitudes to the side posts of this narrow door. One side post denotes the need for an awareness of the one's spiritual bankruptcy, while the other side speaks of the demand for sorrow over sin and a hatred of it. When one enters through the narrow gate, the road to eternal life remains narrow and difficult and requires us to die daily to selfishness but it is the way uh, the Holy Spirit transforms us we will only see the fruit of walking through the narrow gate and the narrow road when we stand before the Lord in eternity and we will see the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives as we look back and we see the instances when the, when the Lord carried us through the difficulties along the, this road in life. I truly believe that we graduate into eternity with the inner character that the Spirit of God has transformed us into. We are to be transformed into the image of Christ. So let's move on. True and false prophets, verse 15. He's then, then talked about, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. False prophets. 
You know, when we think of false prophets, we, we likely think of people that we've seen on the television, religious prophets who speak for five minutes on, uh, on possibly the scripture, but it could be their aunt, or it could be anything that they, any philosophy they want, and then they spend 20 minutes in asking for your money for themselves. We all know of false prophets like that. But that is not the only false prophets that are pandering to us day in, day out. The false prophet looks the part on the outside but talks little about the true things of faith in Christ. I'm talking about repentance and walking with the Lord Jesus and being transformed into his image. This world's false prophets in our time come to us more through lies and deception through the media. Have you ever thought of that? That the false prophets are pandering to us, deceiving us day in, day out, and using the TV. With the repeal of the smith munt Act in, nine, in 2013, propaganda, you may not realize, is now lawful. Uh, to be propagated to the American public. The false prophets come at us on the news programs of today presenting a false reality. And have you noticed they put down everything that is of Christ? Oh, if that name comes up, oh, they quickly change the channel or switch that person off. And I'm sure you've come aware of that. The news programs, whether you realize it or not, are all owned at the board level by spiritual Babylon. And they advance false narratives that seek to promote a world system controlled by evil spirits. And they're acting through people from behind the scenes. We don't see those spirits manipulating us. We just hear their deception day in, day out, if you listen to certain places on the TV. And they promote a world system that is descending deeper and deeper into darkness, the darkness that they want to propagate. And if we continue listening to them, they will, through degrees, slowly get what they hope the world to become. So may God give us discerning, discernment about what channels to watch and who we will listen to because it's uh, deception at the worst. They are false prophets and many of them, well, I, should, I won't go too far, uh, but many of them have been trained in how to dish out propaganda to slowly take us into a darkness that is controlled by evil. May God give us discernment to see the fruit of laws and things that are being supported. We really need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to what's going on. Here's what the Lord says. To the teaching and to the testimony, Isaiah 8 verse 20. If they will not speak according to this word, the scriptures, it is because they have no dawn, no life, no light. If they will not walk with this, the teaching and the testimony of Christ. So with so much deception going on in this world, more than ever, we should be those who search out the scriptures daily. So Jesus goes a bit further warning us in verse 21 as he comes to the uh, end of his uh, sermon. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my f Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day. You notice that? What day? What day is he talking about? The day when God wraps all this up when he says, enough. When the training of his bride is over and the harvest begins, the harvest of this world, 
the setting apart of the grain from, uh, from the weeds, the setting apart of the sheep from the goats. You, you know those passages. There will come a time of separation when God will separate uh, those are, who are his from those who are determined to bring about the agenda of the evil one. That day will come. And uh, there are those that are in, wolves that are in sheep's clothing. They look like genuine believers and they even seem to be walking in power and authority. But they lack the fruit of the Spirit. They'll say the right things, although when you ask them certain things about the Christian faith, they'll avoid plain statements of where they stand on certain sins of the flesh. Some are deceived into thinking they're going to heaven because of their good deeds. I've talked to people on the streets and, and asked them about where they're going, and many of them will say, well, I'm going to heaven because I live in a Christian country. First of all, I'll get that. And others have said to me, well, uh, I've done lots of good things, and I know that God weighs up my good things from my bad things, so I think my good things are going to win. And they kind of think of the judgment as being a, a set of scales, and if you're better than your bad side, then you're going to go to heaven because you're good. How deceptive of the evil one to propagate those thoughts into our minds. Some are deceived by such thinking. But Christ is the door of the sheepfold and he knows if we genuinely believe and trust in him. One of the most horrifying things that I possibly can think of in this world is for somebody to believe they're going to heaven and then when God puts an end to this life and says, okay, now we enter into eternity, for those people to think that they're going to heaven by doing good works, to suddenly be told that they are shut out. How horrifying to, to come like the five foolish virgins on that day. And uh, they had to go and find more oil. And they come later and they knock on the door, please let us in. But Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. One can look the part, even go to church and say the right things, do the right things, do all kinds of good things, but never come into a right relationship with the King of Heaven. So to bring this to an end, let's talk about the wise and foolish builders. Verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock, the rock being the Lord Jesus. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The Lord brings this sermon to an end by talking about how a true believer lives their life by warning us about the foundation of one's faith. Is it really built upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it really built on a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Based on the firm foundation of the outflow of the life of Jesus in you, living in you, does Christ really live in you? 
Have you invited him into the center of your life? Is he sitting on the throne room of your heart, your inner man, directing you, governing your actions? Do you go to him when you have to make a hard decision? Do you ask him about decisions? Or do you make decisions, eternal decisions, based on your own thoughts and your own philosophies? The key is to put into practice what you hear from the Sermon of the Mount. These words of Jesus are like real treasures that will take you to an eternity with him if you put these words into practice. And if you don't, it's like shifting sand under your feet. And life has a way of bringing difficulties to our lives that show us what we're standing on. And I trust that each of us hearing these words today uh, have written them on the tables of your heart, your will, your actions, your motives, uh, and put them to practice and, and have been transparent and open with your life to the Lord and, and been sincere in your desire to walk with him and to not walk according to your own passions and life. My prayer is that each of us hearing these words will not let them slip from your mind, but allow them to bring change to our values and our practices in life. Let's stand and we'll pray and bring our study and our series to an end. Father, we, we do pray, Lord Jesus, that... Uh, you will enable us by your Spirit. Lord, we open our lives to you, Holy Spirit, to come in and fill us with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we, we repent of our old life. We turn around from the things that ruled us and dominated our lives. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive us of sin and come into our lives, fill us with your Spirit, May we walk in integrity and honesty and uh, allow these words of you, Lord Jesus, to rest and be written on the tables of our hearts. And we thank you for the new life that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.